Well, hello and welcome back again. It's John McDonald here from ProScot, uh, rider, driver and rider training. And we've already covered element A and element B. We're now going to look at element C now and all the various skills that you're going to be taught before you can ride out on the road. And uh, we've just had a motorbike start up in the background <laughs> in Matty's workshop. But you should still hopefully be able to hear me okay because I've got a mic on here. So, um, Lewis, have a quick scan around the yard there. That's it. Yeah, around the yard. And um, this is our training area. Now, every approved training body, every school's got to have an approved training area. It's an area that's protected, so people can't just wander in and out. Um, so uh, we've got to manage the risk at all times and create a safe environment for you to be able to learn to ride. The minimum dimensions are 30 feet by 80 feet. That's the minimum dimensions of any yard, and that would be approved for two riders. And then it has to, uh, that's 2,400 square feet, and then it's multiples of 1,200 square feet thereafter for each pupil. Um, it's also fair to say as well that within any yard it must always have the dimensions of minimum of 30 feet and minimum of 80 feet. So that's the first thing to say then about uh, an approved yard that um, each school must use. And that's approved by the Driving Vehicle Standards Agency. Okay, so let's now look at the skills. The first skill we're going to look at is going to be moving off and stopping. So here I have my little one, two, five, and I'm going to be explaining to you now how we move off and stop. Now, please bear in mind here that um, the reason I'm doing this here as a demonstration with myself is that if I was doing it with a with a real pupil, for example, um, then the first thing is the pupil might not necessarily role play all the faults that I'm going to give you an idea that could be created, so that's the first thing. And secondly, if I've got a pupil that can already ride a motorcycle, then my introduction would not be what we call a full briefing. It would just be a, a quick Q&A session, establish the prior knowledge. I might not even have to give a demonstration if this person's ridden before, just simply ask them if they're comfortable enough moving off and stopping, um, and stand at the side of them, observe them, and only really step in if I feel it's absolutely necessary, and I give that person a chance to move off and stop. So this is why I'm doing it with myself rather than with a real pupil, because it means that I can uh, role play um, effectively so you can get the maximum out of the video. So, um, what I'm going to do, I'm going to do an old kind of format, which is I'm going to introduce every lesson to you through a, a, a full explanation or what we would call a briefing back in the day. It's now more of what we call an introduction to the lesson, and the level of introduction we give is really determined by your experience, your knowledge, and that's why it's handy if you watch these videos, because you'll increase your knowledge and understanding, and it means the introduction to each lesson can also be much quicker as well. Just a few questions to establish the prior knowledge and understanding, plus when I give a demonstration of each skill, uh, and the instructor asks you, would you like a demonstration? Hopefully, again, if you've been watching the videos, you'll be able to say, no, oh, I've been watching the videos, don't think a demonstration is necessary. I'm keen to have a go at this. In which case, we're saving time again on the full introduction briefing, and we're also saving time on the demos as well. So please be assured you're not wasting your time watching these videos. This is going to save you time, and it's going to allow you to get more time on the bike, which is really the crucial part, and I keep coming back to that. So let's talk about moving up and stop now. Uh, again, I'm... <laughs> apologising here for uh, people who can already ride a motorbike coming on their CBT because I have to pitch this at a level now for assuming someone with the least amount of knowledge, perhaps a novice r rider or driver, uh, sorry a novice rider who's never driven before and has got no experience on a motorcycle. So let's explain the moving off and stopping. Well, uh, the first thing is <coughs> You've been shown by this time how to stop and start the motorcycle and how to get on and off the motorcycle correctly. So the first thing we do is we get you on the motorcycle and we will get you to start the motorcycle up. As you could probably imagine, the car drivers can work most of this one out. Uh, once you've got the motorcycle started, you'd be pulling the clutch in. I'll explain in a moment for the novices why we do that. Pull the clutch in to disengage the drive. That allows us to select the gear. Remember, we said that you can't uh, change gear um, and you can't move off and you can't come to rest with it still on the bike unless you remember to pull that clutch in. So the first thing is when you've got the bike started up is to pull the clutch in fully to disengage the drive. Car drivers can relate to that one. Of course you've got to select the first gear and we told you first gear was down so your right foot will be down on the ground, your left foot pushes it down into first gear. Um, 
Now you bring your right foot up, covering the rear brake, acting pretty much like the, the, the handbrake on a car. For those that are car drivers, um, you're effectively holding the bike with the rear brake. And this is especially important if it's on a slope, uphill or downhill. Not so important, of course, in the level, the bike wants to sit there for you. But your right foot's up, covering the back brake. And it can also be shown a rear brake light, which might be handy to anyone that's behind you. You would bring the revs up, bearing in mind this is a little small engine here, producing only about 10 horsepower. So you bring the revs up to what we call a little lively hum, and if you come around here, Lewis, on our rev counter, we usually bring the revs up somewhere around about 3,000 revs, okay? So they'll tick over at just above 1,000 revs. You'll find these bikes need to be up what we call a lively hum, sort of between two and 3,000 revs, and that generates enough power to be able to pull off the weight of the motorcycle in yourself. So we set the revs, lively hum, we ease the clutch out slowly for the novice riders to a point called the biting point, I'm going to explain this better to you in a moment, but where the clutch plates begin to connect, come together, and the bike feels like it wants to move. The car drivers can relate to this, I'm sure. So we've got the revs set, we've got the clutch at the biting point now, that's the motorcycle said to be prepared. Now in this very first lesson, it's simply moving off and stopping in a straight line. We don't actually need to build the observations in at this point, because the focus here is getting you to move off and stop in a straight line. However, I will mention observations, because that's the prepare part we've just done. We've prepared the bike ready to move off. Now we would carry out the observations, and I'm going to explain that in a separate video, where we would check both our blind spots. This is areas off to the left. Um, so if we were moving off straight here, for example, we check over the left-hand shoulder to begin with, make sure there's nobody on the pavement, maybe going to come off cyclists, pedestrians, for example. We check our left-hand mirror, which should be properly set and adjusted for us. We'd be looking ahead, we'd be checking our right-hand mirror, and we'd be looking over the right blind spot. In other words, we'd be taking effective observation, ensuring it's safe. Now, again, our car drivers will be able to relate to that one. Moving off from the roadside, you wouldn't just move off without checking it's safe to do it. So, bike's prepared, observations are carried out, and as soon as you carry those observations off, and the head comes round, you're ready to move off. You don't want a big delay from observations to moving off because the situation, of course, could change. And again, our car drivers will be able to relate to that one, I'm sure. So, we've got the, the rev set, we've got the clutch at the biting point, We've carried out our observations, we bring our head back round. Now this is a really important part. A lot of people say things like, release, release the clutch slowly. I've never ever taught that one. When we get the clutch to the biting point where the bike feels like it wants to move, I tell our students to ease the clutch out, typically about the thickness of maybe about a pound coin. And what that does is it squeezes the clutch plates together and generates enough drive to be able to move off. If you don't ease the clutch out quite enough, let's say you only eased it out the thickness of a 50 pence piece, the bike will still move slowly, but you'll find that you'd be skipping your foot, you wouldn't be able to get your balance, so you'd skip your foot a bit before you could bring it up. Of course, if you let it out too far, maybe the thickness is say two pound coins, um, you'll find that the clutch plates will slap together, the bike would jerk and would stall, and again, our car drivers will be able to relate to that. So instead of saying biting point release slowly, I prefer to say biting point released a fixed amount to enable the bike to move off at a, at, with a sufficient movement to maintain the balance. Now that varies from bike to bike, even where the biting point is. We could say it's midway out on the stroke. If we look here, Lewis, come around here, the clutch there may be moving halfway out. But again, it depends on the adjustment on the lever. Some biting points are further in, some biting points are further out. But when you're at the biting point, typically you're doing something like what I've just done there, just moving it out about the thickness of that pound coin, squeezes the clutch plates together and generates enough movement to move off. Now, once the bike starts moving at one or two bite lengths, then you slowly start to ease the clutch out, slowly. All right, so there we go. So that's how you're going to move the bike off. Now, with practice, you begin to practice this, you'll learn just how much to ease that clutch out to generate that initial movement. Remember what I said? If you don't ease it out quite enough, the bike will move very slowly. I'm going to demonstrate this. And if you move it out too far too quickly, you'll slap the plates together and the bike will lurch forward and it'll stall. So the idea is to try and move off smoothly in a controlled fashion. So easing the clutch out. Now, as you're moving off, You'll be looking forward, never looking down at the clock, you're looking forward. A lot of people want to look at the clutch lever at this point and look at the rev counter. Really, your vision needs to be forward where you're going. Now, if you feel the engine revs are coming down a little bit, that is, as you ease the clutch out, there's a bit of load on the engine. Remember, this is a oh, 125 kilogram bike plus your weight, and as I say, only the, really the power of two lawnmowers strapped together. If you hear the engine revs are coming down, then we just pick up those revs a little bit more and, and maintain that lively hum to generate the power for moving off. You're not regulating the speed so much here at this point with the throttle, you're just, if you like, generating the, the power there, but you're generating the drive 
and controlling the drive through the clutch. So don't be frightened to give it a bit more throttle because it's really the clutch ultimately at the end of the day that's going to determine um, how the bike moves off. So your control of the clutch is the key thing here. Now as you begin to move, you'll then bring your foot up and return it back onto left foot peg and that's you in a stable riding position, both feet up in other words. And then as the bike gets moving, you'll ease that clutch out slowly. So that's how you're going to move off, all right? So we call that the POM routine, preparing the bike ready to move off, carrying out your observations, and then the manoeuvre or the move off. Now, when you want to come to rest, Again, um, on the moving off and stopping, we are going to be focused, especially with novices, just on getting you to move off and stop. We're not really too worried about building observations in at this stage, because we know there's quite a lot for you to take in, and trying to build in additional observations can really put you off. But for someone that's a bit more experienced, certainly CBT renewals, we'd be building that in straight away and expect to see that build in straight away. Um, so when you're going to stop, you're now moving along the, the yard slowly. You may still be what we call slipping the clutch. I'll explain that in the next um, in, a, in the next video. You might still be slipping or riding the clutch. The car drivers will understand what I mean by that one. In other words, the clutch is not fully engaged. Or you may have allowed the clutch out fully, and the clutch may be fully engaged, and the bike's now moving along slowly in the first gear with minimum engine rev, just maintaining a slow, steady speed. When you're getting ready to stop now, if you are comfortable enough, you would check your mirrors at this point. But as I say, because we're focusing more on the moving off and stopping, we're not going to push too much for that. And the important thing here would be now to roll back the throttle, in other words, close the throttle, remove the power, and bring in the first brake, which is of course the engine brake. Now because you're going so slow, if you try to brake at this point, remember we said at slow speed you'd only be using the rear brake. No need to use this powerful front brake at this stage, you'd be using the rear brake. If you start applying the rear brake at this stage, and you're going so slow, by the time you get the clutch in, there's every chance the bike could stall. The bike's already going at a very slow speed in the first gear. It's what we call, um, it, it's at the speed that's determined by that particular gear and that particular rev. So you'll find that as you close the throttle and the revs fall down, um, it's already getting close to what we call the, the, the stall speed for that gear. And if you start to brake against it, you're going to find the bike wants to judder and it would want to stall. So you're literally, as you close the throttle and the bike slows right down to the tick over in that first gear, when you want to stop, you're pulling the clutch in to disengage the drive. Now that's not coasting, you're disengaging the drive because you want to stop. And then you're going to be applying the rear brake gently. Now, at the time that you're closing that throttle, it's a good idea to have your left foot already out, hovering in anticipation of the stop. It's a bit like the landing gear coming down on an aeroplane. And it also means that when you put the left foot out, you're guaranteeing that the bike wants to tip to left. And remember, you want to be using the rear brake, you don't want it to fall to the right. So by putting the left foot out, and hovering to the left, the bike naturally wants to fall to the left or to tip to the left is probably a bit of phrase to say. When you say fall, that worries everybody. Close, so you've closed the shuttle, you're pulling the clutch in, so you've taken away the power, you've disengaged the drive, the left foot's out hovering above the ground, you're now squeezing the back brake to bring the bike to a, a controlled stop, and just as the bike stops, you touch the left foot down. And that's how we move off and stop. Now let's just explain the clutch a little bit more for our novice riders. You have gotten here, an engine, all right? Now that engine is generating power for us. We said, and well, B remember, we have a gearbox. Works on the same principle as your um, gears on your push bike, for example. We also have um, a drive chain connected to the back wheel. Now the important bits to remember here are engine, clutch mechanism, gearbox, and the drive chain to the black wheel. Now the bit that I want to specifically talk about is the clutch. Now the clutch can be thought of very simply as like two plates, if you imagine two plates. <coughs> now when we pull the clutch in like this, in other words we disengage the clutch, we pull the plates apart. Strong springs pull them, uh, 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 they're pulled apart. Now it doesn't matter if we're in gear and we're revving the engine, because the clutch plates are not connected, the one here that's connected to the engine is spinning round because I'm got the throttle going, so it's spinning round, but it's not connected to this plate yet. So it doesn't matter if it's in the gear, if I've got that clutch held in, I could rev this as much as I like, it's not going to go anywhere. I need to bring these clutch plates together, so that as this one's going round that's connected to the engine, the strong springs push them hard together, that's why they're called friction plates, and both the plates go round together. So in this position, if you come round Lewis, when the clutch is in the outward position like this, Okay, if the clutch is in the outward position, like that, then the strong springs are connected together. So, the, sorry, the, 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 the clutch plates are connected together. Now, if I was in gear now, and I'm now 
revving the bike, this plate's going round, but because it's connected to this plate now, the clutch mechanism's connected and it's said to be engaged. So in the out position, it's said to be engaged. Car drivers will relate that to that as the clutch fully up. Connection's made. Now, providing I'm in the gear and I've got that connection made, the bike's going to be moving. Now, let's supposing I had the clutch out fully, but I was in neutral for the novice drivers here. In other words, I was between one and two. Remember we explained that in, in, in element B? So the bike's in neutral, the green light's on, N. It's not connected, it's not in a gear. You could rev it as much as you like now, the bike's not going to go anywhere, because although the clutch plates are together, there's still a brake in the link. The brake being, it's not in gear, there's a neutral. So there's how your clutch mechanism works. Now, when we explain when we're moving off, and if you come in here, Lewis, and we said that the clutch was held in, we use that position, clutch in, for when we're changing gear. If we're coming to rest, we pull the clutch in so it disengages the drive, so that it doesn't stall the bike. And also when we're moving off, we ease the clutch out slowly until those clutch plates start to meet. Now, you'll know when they're going to meet because, we'll look back up again, Lewis, as the clutch plates begin to meet and you get to the biting point, you'll feel the bike wants to start moving. That's the biting point. Now, all hell's about to break loose if you just ping it out after that, and every car driver knows that as well. It's the same with the motorbike. You have to ease it out, as I say, this fixed distance. I'm giving you a thickness of roughly a pound coin here. P push those plates together and start to generate the movement, and then as the bike starts to move off, release it slowly. Now we also use the clutch for the slipping point. Now, again, this is very important. When you get to the biting point and you ease that clutch out enough just to generate the movement, instead of continuing to allow the clutch to go out and engage fully so full connection is made, you pull it back in slightly. Now let's just say that I've had to move it out, I don't know, from the biting point, six, seven credit cards to generate movement, thickness, six and seven credit cards, which is about, say, six millimeter as an example, five, five millimeter, something like that. My thickness of my pound coin. So I've got the bike moving. If I now pull that clutch back in slightly, what I'm doing is I'm causing the plates to slip. The one that's connected to the engine's got the lively hum, so it's going faster. The other one's not fully connected, it's going a bit slower. So one's going fast and the other one's a little bit slower. So in other words, it's what we call slipping the clutch. The Americans call it the friction zone. We're not allowing those clutch plates to come fully together. Now that's very, very important for when you're moving off smoothly and it's also going to be a key skill to learn for when you're doing your manoeuvres later on as well. Okay? So that's how we move off with the motorcycle. So we're now going to get onto the motorcycle and actually demonstrate this now. So, start the motorcycle up as you were shown in element B. So, I'm making sure it's in neutral, rocking it back and forward, clutch in, push the start button and we're started up. Clutch in, click it into first gear, left foot down, right foot up, bringing a little lively hum up, so I'm bringing the revs up, as you can see Lewis, about 3,000 revs there, yeah, about 3,000 revs. Putting the clutch in, I'm trying to let you see the clutch there, there it is there, there's the biting point it wants to move, I'm bringing it back in, so there's the biting point. Now watch how I just let that out, and I'm going to put just two fingers on, just so that you can see what I'm doing with the clutch. If I let that out the thickness of about a pound coin, and there you go, the bike moves off. So you see there how I just let that out a fixed amount. So let's put the whole lot together now. So, I've got the revs up, close to the biting point. Checking my left blind spot, my left mirror. Now I'm keeping my visor up there now, just so that I can kind of see the camera and see you. So my left blind spot, my left mirror, looking ahead. And I want you to see my eyes, looking in the right mirror and looking over my right shoulder to the blind spot. Increase the res a bit more, pound coin out, foot up. Brake, clutch in, foot out, stop and touch down. Okay, let's put that all together again for you. I'll just go back into neutral, show it for you again. Just going back. And I'm going to show you another move off and stop again. And this time, Lewis, you can maybe go more to the front this time, so you actually see what I'm doing when I come to rest as well. So again, clutch is in. Select the first gear, left foot down, right foot up. Lively hum, generating the power. Clutch to the biting point. I feel it wanting to go there at that point. Check my left blind spot, my left mirror, looking ahead. Right mirror, right blind spot. Ease the clutch out, thickness of pound coin. Bring the foot up. Gently, slowly release the clutch, reduce the revs. Close shuttle, clutch in, back brake, foot out, stop, and foot down. Now notice how I was wobbling a little bit at the end there. So this time I'm going to do a positive move off and a positive stop 
because if you move off too slow you skip your feet and if you stop and take too long to slow down the stop you can also wobble as well so let's put the whole lot together now a bit faster and you can see the whole lot getting put together foot up close throttle clutch in brake out stop foot down okay now what I'm going to do now is I'm now going to put my helmet down and what I want to do now is show you typical kind of faults that we see now, okay? <clears throat> and hopefully, can you still see my face okay with the visor up? And I'm wanting to make sure that you can still hear me okay as well. So let's show some of the faults then. Now, first of all is how we're going to do this with you. So if you come down, Lewis, lots of instructors have got different ways of showing you how to move off and stop. Some will stand in front of you covering the controls. I used to do that one, but I found that a lot of students are terrified they're going to run you down, so they don't like it. I used to stand at the side and, excuse me a second while I show this one, Lewis. I used to stand at the side of pupils like this, covering their clutch and holding the back of the bike at the side of them. But a lot of students feel a little bit intimidated because you're standing so close to them and your hand's over the top of their hand, potentially on the clutch. So, how I tend to do it now is I tend to stand by the side of them. Uh, ready to step in and get the clutch in if I need to, to take control. So it's less obtrusive, is what I'm trying to say. And we tried to build you there in stages. So here's how we would do it in stages for you. First of all, <coughs> we'll get you to start the motorcycle up like this. And we'll get you to pull the clutch in, put in first gear, and you'll notice that now I'm not putting my hand on the throttle at all. We'll get you just to find the biting point, first of all, and know where it is. Now don't worry if you let out too much, watch, the worst that can happen. I just pinged that. Now, because we've not got any revs set, it didn't go shooting away. Now, if I had lots of revs on there, I'd been in big trouble. So we let you do it, first of all, with no revs, till we know you've got the clutch. Now, again, I'm going to do it with just two fingers, but I want you with all four. It's just so you can see what the end of the lever, and you can see what I'm doing. There's the biting point. We get you to go out one credit card. It, it just takes up the slack. Two credit cards. It wants to move. Three credit cards. And let your feet come forward. You're not trying to balance. And then four okay and we'll do this in stages just letting you get the clutch out a little bit further each time and moving the bike forward slowly now if you let out too quick it'll just stall and we will not let you have the revs till we know that you've got control of the clutch now once you've got control of the clutch and you're letting it out a credit card at a time we do one credit card then we go to two credit card then three then four then five till eventually you can do this sort of thing the bike's moving your feet's paddling and then it's clutched back in again. Now you can hear the bike judding a little bit because it wants power. So the next thing we do is we get you to have a little bit of power now. Now again, I wouldn't be so keen now to ping that clutch out, but remember we don't let you do that till we know that you've got clutch control. So we get you to practice a lively hum, looking ahead where you're going, find the biting point, and then we go through the same routine again. One credit card to begin with, then two credit cards, then three, then four, then five. And each time practicing closing the throttle clutch in. So let's show you how that swaps. One credit card that barely moves. Close throttle clutch in. Then we'll get you to do two credit cards out. It moves a little bit more. Close throttle clutch in. Notice both feet's down on the ground here. Then we're going to go to three credit cards. Keeping a lively hum. Close throttle clutch in. Then I'm going to go to four credit cards. Now notice the bike's moving a bit faster. Still not fast enough to get balance. You're probably going to need to be about five or six credit cards, in other words, out about the thickness of a pound coin, before you've got enough clutch drive to get the balance. So eventually we'll work you up. Now remember your instructor will be standing ready to catch that clutch if you get a bit excited. Now you're not trying to balance the bike at this moment. You've still got both your feet on the ground. You're not trying to balance. You can't balance at this speed. You need to be doing at least, at least a brisk, at least walking pace, moving towards a brisk walking pace, which is at least somewhere in the region of three to four mile per hour at least. Now at the moment we're lucky if we're doing one to two mile per hour at the moment, so not enough to get the feet up. This is all about practicing the movement. So here we go, the clutch is going a bit further out now, about five. Close the throttle clutch in, and notice the bike wants to keep going. That's when we bring in the next stage now. If we come back now, this is when we now allow you to put your right foot up, covering the back brake. Again, your instructor's still standing by you, ready to step in if they need. So now we bring the rear brake in. Now, when you want to move off, that rear brake has to be off. Again, the lively hum to the biting point, and we'll only go one credit card out to begin with, so the bike hardly moves. Then two, and all we do is we get you to skip the left foot, close throttle clutch in, rear brake. And then we go to three credit cards. 
Again, not trying to balance, close throttle clutch in, back brake. Again, we'll go to four credit cards, bike moves a bit further, close throttle clutch in, rear brake. Come around this side now, Lewis. And what you'll see happens is I'm skipping my left foot. Now eventually I spend more time in the air than I do skipping on the ground. Now at the moment I'm not trying to balance this bike, I'm keeping the weight on my left foot, the bike's tilted on my left foot, I'm only focusing on the movement and the stopping. So lively hum, clutch out now about three, skipping a little bit, not enough to bring my foot up in balance, close throttle clutch in, back brake. Then we get to about four credit cards, close throttle clutch in, back brake. As you can imagine, the next one then is going to be five credit cards. Again, each time we're building this up so that we're getting more and more movement till we get to the point where we feel like the, the, the foot wants to come up. Again, looking forward, lively hum, clutch to the biting point, five credit cards, back brakes off. There's five credit cards out, it's, my foot's skipping more in the air now, close throttle clutch in, back brake. Guess what, by the time you get to about six or seven, you're going to feel like you can start to bring that left foot up. So let's show what happens when we get to that stage. Again, looking forward, we're not trying to balance the bike. If I try and balance the bike then I bring my foot up, I'll probably end up falling over. We're still wor working on the movement phase just now, moving and stopping. Now watch now, eventually I get the clutch out enough that I can bring the foot up. Hover, close throttle clutch in, back brake, stop and foot down. Now, so we're going to take you there in stages in other words. Now if you're lucky to have a longer leg, like this, like what I've got, six foot, then the bike moves forward and then that foot then comes up. If you're shorter of the leg, then you find that you have to get from standstill to the brisk walking pace in a shorter distance so that the foot can literally come straight up. In other words, that's why you have to let the clutch out a little bit further to generate more drive. But we'll take you there in stages. We don't want you to go pinging that clutch out. So there's how we're going to teach you how to move off and stop. And there's the stages. Now, the interesting thing about it is, and we could do the slow speed riding tagged onto this, this video, I think, Lewis, is that once we get moving now, I can demonstrate to you now how we can do slow speed riding. Again, I'll put my visor back down for this one since we're starting to get moving now. And hopefully you're still hearing me loud and clear. Now what I'm going to do this time now, Lewis, is I'm going to move, okay, do my checks, moving off, bringing the foot up, got enough movement to bring the foot up. Now, if I let that clutch out fully like it is just now, and I touch the throttle, you'll see the bike, if I, unless I'm very smooth with the throttle, You'll see it's quite jerky at the moment. All right. Now, if I close the shuttle, the bike will go at the speed determined by the tick over. And a lot of people think that that's slow speed riding. But as I'm going to show you in a moment, it would cause you lots of problems on a big motorcycle if you were doing this. All right, and I'll show you why in a moment. Now, at the moment, it looks like I'm doing great slow speed riding. But if I took a hold of the, the mirrors and put my foot off, you'll see that I'm actually cheating. Now, watch what I do now. If I touch the throttle, on and off, it's quite, quite jerky. But watch what I do now when I'm slipping the clutch. A lively hum, and the clutch plates are slipping, just generating just enough drive to get moving, but not fully engaged. If I balance that now with a little bit of rear brake, then you'll see I'm now starting to do slow speed riding. I've got a little lively hum. Down the hill I don't need it, I'm just down a slope. If you're going down a slope, you would just close the shuttle, clutch in a little bit below the biting point, control it with the back brake. Here on the level, I've just got just enough revs and just enough drive to maintain the movement. Just gently covering the back brake, but not using it. As I go up a slight slope that we've got here in our yard, then what I'm doing, and I'll explain why we've got our yard set up this way, to generate better bike control, because it's Scotland we live in, not Holland. You've got to learn how to cope with different cambers and slopes, and how to balance the throttle, the clutch and the brake, and I'll explain that one better in the next exercise. So you'll see at the moment then, I'm balancing the throttle, the clutch and the rear brake, I'm holding my vision up, I'm looking well forward, I'm not flapping my knees, I'm holding the tank gently. I've got a relaxed posture, I'm sitting well forward on the motorcycle. Relaxed arms, relaxed shoulders, vision up, looking where I'm going. A little lively hum, just slipping the clutch gently, and if I need to, I'm using a little bit of back brake at times if I need to, just to control my speed as well. Now this is, the, this is the, the style of riding that you're going to use for slow speed bike control and it's particularly important when you get onto the larger motorcycle. So we're going to stop there, alright? So there we go, there's an explanation then of the moving off and stopping and how to slip the clutch and we're going to show you how we're going to use that more now on the next lessons as well. 
Okay, so so far then we've shown you how to, we've explained how to move off and stop in a motorcycle, and then we've actually given a demonstration of the correct way to move off and stop. What I thought might be advantageous now is to show you some areas of weakness that we see some of the students having on each of the skills, and we'll tag them on to the end of the videos, and hopefully that will kind of give you an idea of the, some of the areas of weakness that people have. So first thing is then for moving off. So the things that we see, um, people trying to put the bike into gear without remembering to pull the clutch in, that's one for the novices um, especially. But here's common ones, um, moving off and not having enough revs. So as they go to move off, the bike just wants to stall. So forgetting to bring the lively hum up, that's a common one. Or this one, setting the lively hum up to begin with, and as they ease the clutch out, dropping the revs off. So remember, we must maintain the power to be able to move off, so maintain the power. The next one is the clutch release, that's a common fault. We get the clutch to the biting point, and if you're coming a bit closer, Lewis, we see this sort of thing. Lunging the clutch out too far. Now, all right, that's a very common one, just letting the clutch out too quick and too far. Now, remember what we said, release it slowly about the thickness of a pound coin. Now, if I do that, even if I do it quickly, the thickness of a pound coin from biting point watch, quickly, pound coin, it doesn't stall. All right, so the cl clutch release issues, that's a common one. Here's another one, trying to move off too slow, not letting the clutch out enough, and as you can see there now, skipping the feet, and I really can't get balanced, and if I do try and bring my feet up, I'm falling over. So not allowing the clutch out far enough, that's the opposite of the last fault I just shown, weakness has shown, where the clutch was out too, too much, not letting it out enough. Here's another one, trying to lift the foot up before the bike moves. <laughs> Make sure the bike's moving before you bring the foot up. Now, because I've got a longer leg, I can start with the foot in front, but notice I get the bike moving, and then I bring the foot up. So don't try to just bring the foot up and then move it. <laughs> That's very hard. Now, even if you've got a wee short leggy, as you can see there now, watch what I do. Move the bike and straight up. But you have to move off positively. So we usually see some sort of problem then with the throttle, not enough gas, or maybe moving off with too much gas, allowing the clutch out too quick, releasing too quick, um, trying to move off too slow, not getting the balance, or as I say, trying to move off too fast, release the clutch too quickly. Other ones we see if we come around this side, Lewis, is quite a common one, is trying to move off, this is especially for the car drivers, they end up pushing the back brake as they're trying to move off because they're thinking it's a throttle, <laughs> an accelerator pedal on the car. That's a back brake now, there's no point pushing that one down, it's not going to rev any higher. So do remember to release the back brake. So there's all the kind of typical moving off ones. Now remember we did say that the observations isn't really part of the move off and stop in a straight line. We get that achieved first and then we build in the observations. But um, when we do get you competent moving off and stopping and we're building observations, we some see, sometimes see observation weaknesses, i.e. forgetting to take the observations, um, not checking the blind spots, doing the checks and then taking too long to move off. Or maybe, this is a common one as well, still doing the observations as they move off. So you're still looking back as you move off, forgetting to complete the observations and then move off. So again, something maybe tied in with observations. And let's look at typical kind of stopping weaknesses then. Lewis, we see this one quite a lot moving off and then doing this, putting the foot on the ground before the bikes actually came to rest and as soon as you do that it pulls the foot back. Now typically it's a lot of the smaller riders that do that one. In fact what a lot of the smaller riders will do is they'll come forward and they try and put both their feet down like this and then they have to grab the front brake. Now one way of making sure for the smaller riders is put your left foot out and hover it and it'll always land to the left. I'll show you this very quickly, just stepping off the bike very quickly to show you it. If I stand straight, put my left leg out, it'll always fall to the left. If I stand straight, start putting that right foot out, eventually it'll pull me to the right. So when you're coming to rest, dangle your left foot off to the side like that and it'll ensure the bike tilts to the left. Don't try and tip your whole body, that can have too much of an effect and really make the bike flip to the left. So just put the left leg out, that's enough, and it makes the bike tip over. And don't put the foot on the ground till the bike has come to a rest, a stop. It's a bit like opening a car door and getting out before the car stopped. You would never do it. Same on a motorbike. So hover the left foot out, wait till it's stopped, and then touch down. Let me show you the whole lot put together correctly to show you what that looks like. So I'll just move off, stop in a short distance. There we go. Hover, stop, touch down. Solid touch down. Okay, other ones that we see when coming to rest, forgetting to close the throttle. I'll say 
So maybe keeping the revs on, pulling the clutch in, braking, stopping, but the revs are still up. Forgot to remove the power. Other one, braking, slowing, putting the foot down, but forgetting to pull the clutch in, so of course the bike stalls when it stops. Or, this is quite a common one, being too gentle with the rear brake, and when you come to rest, this sort of idea. Wobbling, and then falling over. In other words, bring it, as you, you needed a positive move off to get your balance, you also need a positive stop. So use enough pressure to bring the bike to a positive stop. If you're too light with the pressure, when you put your left foot out, the bike starts to wobble if it goes from four mile per hour down to three, down to two, down to one. The bike starts to wobble and it feels like it's going to fall over. So there you go, there, there's some of the typical areas of weakness then that we sometimes see with the moving off and stop in a lesson. Okay, so you're back with John McDonald again. We're still in the yard here on Element C and we're now looking at a skill called rear observations. Now rear observations, the car drivers already know this one, um, is being aware of what's happening behind you just as much as what's happening in front. Now in a motorcycle, the reason it's not mirror signal manoeuvre like it is in a car, where the mirrors are quite effective in a car, you've got your main mirror uh, inside the car which gives you a view directly out the back and it's got flat glass so the, what you see in the centre mirror in terms of distance is pretty much what you've got behind you and you've got a wide field of vision there even out the back window directly behind you also have what used to be referred to as wing mirrors because it used to be on the wings or door mirrors or now external mirrors and these are on the outside of the car uh, you have a, another mirror for the uh, instructor if you're getting a car lesson, but that's for the instructor of course. The main ones for you as a driver, a car driver would be the main mirror and the two external mirrors. Now those external mirrors give you a view, a wider field of vision because they're set further out for starters. If you look at the motorcycle here, they're quite narrow and there is no centre mirror. So first problem we've got with the motorbike, we don't have a centre mirror and we have these two mirrors here for, which are not set out nearly as wide as a car would be and on a car they tend to be bigger and they also um, um, are, are, uh, are convex all right, which means that they're curved slightly outwards to give a wider field of vision now this is to try and reduce the blind spot but in doing so they do make objects look further away so it does make things look further away now in the motorcycle is the same thing the glass that's in this does tend to make objects look a, a little bit further away um, because it's trying to give you a wider field of vision. So the first thing to realise is when you look in the mirrors in your motorcycle, objects might be further away, uh, closer than they actually appear. So that's the first thing to be aware of. Also, you need to be aware of the restricted vision that you do get with the mirrors and we're going to explain that to you in a moment and actually show you the, the blind spots that you get on a motorcycle and a lot of car drivers aren't aware of just how restrictive the mirrors are so when we talk about mirror signal manoeuvre on a car that changes to OSM, observation signal manoeuvre on a motorbike because it's sometimes a combination of both mirror checks and rearward glances to keep yourself fully aware of what's happening behind you the mirrors on a the motorcycle, they're certainly a bit more effective than they used to be years ago I used to look in them years ago and they would just be vibrating away and it was it's very hard to tell what's happening behind you at all so you did spend quite a bit of time having to look backwards but some of the mirrors on the bikes nowadays are quite effective but there are still large blind spots and I'm going to show you how you eliminate that so the reason then that we need to be just as aware of what's happening behind us is, is in front is that of course in a motorcycle we don't have any rear protection behind us also if we're moving to the left or moving to the right or moving off and we were to get hit by uh, a car driver lorry driver bus driver i think you'll agree that we don't have the metal shell and protection around about us so it's very important then that we're just as aware of what's happening behind us as we are in front and that is before particular things happen so for example moving off and stopping now we've already explained that one this morning if i'm going to move off then before we move off we need to take effective observation checking the blind spot left mirror, looking ahead, right mirror, and over the right blind spot. Now if I was moving from the right hand side to move left, I would reverse that. I would start on the right blind spot, right mirror, looking ahead, left mirror, and the left blind spot. Now it's very important that you set your mirrors up to give yourself the best possible view directly behind me. 
so for example when I got on this motorcycle here and I got on the motorcycle and I sat okay I've got in the centre stand now but when it was off the centre stand I set it up so I could see the blue mini directly behind me if you look behind me Lewis the blue mini um, so I looked behind me to think okay I want to be able to see that blue mini so I set that up to be able to see the blue mini on this mirror and the same with this mirror so I could see the blue mini now if you're chain moving it don't try and move the whole mirror you'll end up loosening the arms hold the arms and then adjust the head to what you need and so you can see so I've adjusted those mirrors for the optimum view that I can get with those mirrors all right so the first thing to do is always set your mirrors up now <coughs> we would use our mirrors then and our rear observations before we move off and before we slow down to stop we would also check our mirrors being aware of what's happening behind us and making sure it's safe to stop so always taking rear observations before moving off and before stopping we should also take rear observations before we start a maneuver before we signal so observation signal maneuver maneuver uh, on, a, on a car it's msm mirror signal maneuver so we would check our mirrors before we, we commence any maneuver now a maneuver usually involves a change in speed or a change in position um, so anything like that potentially puts us at risk so we want to check and assess the position speed of falling traffic before we start that <coughs> so we check our mirrors then before the OSM PSL routine or as part of the OSM PSL routine I should say we also check our mirrors before we make any adjustment in speed so let's say I was going to be slowing down for a hazard in front no point slowing down for the hazard in the front without making an assessment of the position and speed of traffic behind and that then effectively determines a safe rate of deceleration based on what's happening behind me the same as if I'm going to be accelerating I want to check my mirrors before I make that change in speed to accelerate so I can assess traffic flow behind let's give an example let's say I've entered into a new road and I'm just about to accelerate up to speed on the new road and I see someone going out to overtake me on a little scooter and there's a car coming towards me if I continue to accelerate I'm going to trap the little scooter trying to overtake me so in that instance there I would reduce my rate of acceleration to allow the vehicle to pass or the scooter to pass let's suppose I've been peeping and creeping out of a junction to emerge and I've got the best possible view I could at a point where I think I now, I now need to commit and I start to pull out and as I pull out I notice a vehicle's catching in fast from behind then I would accelerate up to the appropriate speed notice I say up to the appropriate speed for the road the traffic uh, the condition and the speed limit I'd accelerate up to the appropriate speed quicker than I would do normally so that I'm not causing uh, a, an obstruction effectively to the vehicle that's coming along the major road and I'm getting up to the appropriate speed now if that vehicle wants to catch me in and break the speed limit and pass me that's entirely up to them but as long as I get up to the appropriate speed before uh, they catch me in now if I check my mirrors though and there's nothing behind me then I'm just going to accelerate as normal so there's three instances where one where I would accelerate um, slower than normal reduce my rate of acceleration one where I would accelerate quicker than normal and one where I would accelerate as normal so I'm just basically giving you an idea then that how important it is to check your mirrors to determine an appropriate rate of acceleration and deceleration if I'm going to be slowing down to pull in to stop at a shop for example and I see, see my mirrors and there's a 40 foot articulated lorry close behind me then I'm going to reduce my speed more gently I'm going to show a bit of brake light first obviously be given my indicator before I show my brake light so I'll be checking my mirrors indicating to let the vehicle know what I'm doing then maybe just operating just the micro switch just enough to bring the brake light in and then have a gradual rate of deceleration to give the driver at the back time to respond remember what I said we're going to try and protect the rear of this motorcycle so there's an example then where you want to make a full assessment using your mirrors so that you can make a, an appropriate adjustment um, before slowing and accelerating now the same goes for if you're going to change direction now by changing direction we mean moving to the right or to the left now the rule basically is that the, the greater the change of direction that you have to make, the, um, <coughs> then potentially the more danger there is of you moving into someone's path. So let's suppose, for example, I'm going to have to move out for parked cars. Then there could be somebody already moved out overtaking me. So I'd want to check my right mirror and my light blind spot. And I'm going to show you why in a moment with these cones. If I'm going to move back over to the left, I'd want to check my left mirror and my left blind spot to make sure it's safe before I move over. Now the same would be true if I was going to be making lane changes. Moving over to my right lane, I'd be checking my right mirror, right shoulder check to make sure it's safe before moving over and again before moving to come back in. Same as if I was turning right on a roundabout and I'm going to come off the roundabout, I check my mirror, my shoulder to make sure it's safe before I exit and move off the roundabout. If I'm going through a roundabout in the left hand lane, I'm going to be moving back towards the right to get to the exit, I'm going to have a little check my mirror and over my shoulder to make sure it's safe. So based on a motorcycle, before we make any movement to the left or to the right, we want to make sure it's safe before we make that movement. And basically the greater the rate of change of direction and the more chance of something 
everything being alongside you, then the more important that look becomes. One of the biggest one, which is referred to as a lifesaver, and we'll explain this later on junction section, is if you're turning right from a major road to a minor road on your right, and there's a chance that somebody could be overtaking you, maybe the sun, you've got your right indicator on, and you're slowing down, but the sun's beating on the rear of your bike, and they've not noticed that your indicator's on, or your indicator might even have failed without your knowledge, and they've not noticed the brake light, you're turning right, and you turn right at the junction, they're overtaking you, boof, that's you, knocked off your bike. So you check your mirror, your blind spot, make sure it's safe before you turn in. Now that's referred to as the lifesaver look. So it's very important then that you know when to take these mirror checks and shoulder checks before, as I say, moving off, before stopping, before signalling, before starting any type of manoeuvre, before changes of speed and changes in direction. Now if you're riding along the road, you're not moving off stopping, you're not signalling, you're not making changes of speed and changes of direction, you would therefore think, well that means I don't need to check my mirrors. Well, no, it couldn't be further for the truth. On top of those, we'll call them mandatory checks, you should be regular regularly checking your mirrors anyway as part of a regular scanning process where you're looking to the foreground, the midground, the distance, out to the sides and in your mirrors. So you've got this full 360 degree awareness of what's going on around about you, especially to the right and to the left if you're going to be changing direction as well. So there you go then, we're going to be making sure that you understand when and how to use your mirrors and we're going to be getting you to practice in the yard the skill that I'm going to show you now which is taking effective rear observation, you, learning how to check your left mirror, your left blind spot and your right mirror and your right blind spot. Now to save us a little bit of time here, I've set up some cones. Now what I did earlier is I sat on the motorcycle and Lewis if you give me the camera just now, it's probably the easiest way to do this one actually, if you just give me the camera just now and I'll try and hold it and this is where I make a real mess of it. Lewis has been doing great with his camera work. Now at the moment I've got cones out to the side of me because when I was facing forward all right you can't really see it on the camera here but my peripheral vision allowed me to pick up Lewis when he walked up the side of me and we put two cones down to simulate that. Then when I looked forward again with my crash helmet on, Lewis walked up to the right hand side of me and simulated and put down two cones when I could see him. So basically from the cones there, sweeping the camera around to there, uh, in fact if we just go to there, so from the two cones there, round to there, oops, to there, that's what my forward vision gives me looking at my helmet. Now, I'm now going to go to the front of the motorcycle and we've created a V at the back of the motorcycle. Now when I look in my mirrors, I got Lewis to stand right in the middle behind the motorcycle and to walk out sideways and when I lost him out the mirror, I, I, I got him to place a cone down. He started with these two cones immediately behind me, here and here. And then he did the same thing from the middle and as you can see he walked out and put another cones out and you can see that line going down the left and the line going down the right. Now what that means is basically everything in this area here where I'm walking just now can be seen in the mirrors. So if someone was on the motorcycle, and Lewis if you tighten up, straighten up the bars on the motorcycle Lewis, and I'll walk forward. So anything in this V at the back here can be seen with the mirrors. So if you straighten up the bike there then Lewis, the, the handlebars, now the motorcyclist would be able to see me standing directly behind. Now. This area here though, is called the blind spot area. So, anything that falls in this area that I'm walking in just now, I can't see from a normal seated position just looking in forward and looking in the mirrors. So in other words, this whole area here is a blind spot. The same as this whole area here, from those two cones on the left to these cones on the right, that whole area is a blind spot. Now just think, we could actually have a car in this whole area here, run alongside us, and we wouldn't be able to see it at all. So the blind spots are absolutely massive, and I'm going to get Lewis to stand in there now just to give you a perspective. So Lewis, stand in the blind spot for us, please. So there he goes, Lewis gets on camera for the first time. <laughs> there he goes, so Lewis is standing in what's known as the blind spot area. That whole area with the cones to the left and to the right of Lewis is a blind spot area. Walk about in the blind spot area there Lewis, yes, good, that's it. Good, so from there basically, right round to there. You'll notice the further out it extends, the bigger it becomes. Good, and then come forward, good. And the same on this side as well, that's a whole blind spot area over there. Good, so Lewis is showing that. Good, there you go Lewis, you can have the camera back again. Now, <coughs> thank you. Now, let me get back on the motorcycle. Now, <coughs> 
to eliminate, and please excuse me for sitting on the motorcycle with the side stand up, I've got a good reason for wanting to do this one for you. So when you're riding along the motorbike and you're looking at those mirrors, you're only going to see that area directly behind. If I now needed to move to the left, or I needed to move to the right, I think you could see there could be something in my blind spot that I wouldn't be aware of. Now I'm going to put my visor down for this one to make it more effective. Alright, now... What I need to do now is this. So, Lewis, if you stand back over there and we'll get to see me, you turn your head so your chin's in line with your shoulder, all right, and you roll your eyes round, and that's me now able to see Lewis in the blind spot area. Good, there we go. Over to the other side now, Lewis. And I'll turn my head again, and we'll be able to see Lewis. Now, at the moment, I can't see him in the mirror, but if I do that, again, I've got Lewis. Now, just to prove it, Lewis, put your hand up, and I'll tell you when you put your hand up. That's it, you just put your hand up. So I can now see Lewis. Now, stay where you are, Lewis. We're not looking for low-flying aircraft. We're not looking for slugs. We're looking at car height, waist height, person height sort of thing, all right? Now, again, it's not that. <laughs> it, and it's not this one either. We don't need to look back too long. You cover the, the, the ground at one and a half feet per second per mile per hour. So if putting that into feet then, if you were doing 30 mile per hour, that's 45 feet, which is just about 15 meters there or thereabout, okay? Now that's a big distance to travel without looking where you're going. So this is how it should look then when it's done correctly. Relaxed arms and shoulders, there, check, done. There, check, done. So if I was doing right mirror and shoulder, it'd be mirror, shoulder, forward. Now go to the other side, Lewis. And if I was going to be going to the left, Mirror, shoulder check. Now you'll notice I've got relaxed arms and shoulders. Some people have um, big padding here and the padding catches on their helmet and they end up doing this, trying to twist their body. Now the reason I've got this front wheel elevated is I want to show you that you should put no pressure at all through the bars. If you twist in your whole body like this and you move the, the bars, the bike's going to wobble when you carry out your rear observation. You want relaxed arms and shoulders, so when you turn, you're not moving. And notice my front wheel's not moving. Now watch somebody who's tense. Look, see I'm pulling on the bars. Every time I do that, this bike would wobble veer and veer off course. So relaxed arms and shoulders, turn the chin till it's in line with the shoulder, roll the eyes round to the corner, and that's the blind spot checked. I can see the cones at the back with that, and the same over there. Okay, so there's me just demonstrated it. Now what we're going to do is we're now going to ride round the yard. And I'm going to demonstrate to you the skill that we get you to practice in the yard. We get you to practice um, shoulder checks. Um, you can imagine I could tell you some of the faults and weaknesses that we see after I've demonstrated it correctly, but you could probably work some of them out for yourself. So I'll put the visor down, I'll ride round, and uh, I'll demonstrate. Okay, Lewis, so just film me going round doing shoulder checks. And you can even stand to the side if you want in some cases. So, let's imagine I'm going down this side here. On one side of the yard, we get you to do the right hand mirror, right hand shoulder. So there's my right mirror, I'll look back for Lewis, and there you go, there's my lifesaver look done. We're going to do the left hand side now. Lewis isn't going to be far, fast enough over, but I'm going to do left mirror. And I just picked him up there and I looked over my left hand shoulder. And again, round this side, if Lewis stands where he is now, I'll be able to pick him up. I'm going to do right mirror, and then right shoulder. Get over to left hand side, Lewis. So Lewis is going to run over this time. There you go, Lewis, film me now doing it. So this time, left mirror, left shoulder, and forward. Now let's do the whole thing at, at, at proper speed. I'm in first gear now, let's do it proper speed. Right mirror, right shoulder, and then I would change direction to the right. I've made sure it's safe to go to the right. Let's do the left now, keeping the bike nice and straight. Left mirror, left shoulder, and forward again. And there we go. Now let's show you some of the problems that we see. And we see people doing things like staring in the mirror too long. It's so looking up at the sky, looking at the ground. Or looking and then wobbling off course. Keep the bike straight. Being too tense with the shoulders and the arms. Again, I'll show you here and you'll see me wobbling as I look over. Mirror, look, and the bike wobbled as I looked over. And that's really the sort of problems that we see, okay? We tend to see people either staring in the mirrors too long or not looking quite long enough to get the information they require, staring up at the sky, staring down at the ground, um, staring back too long, you're not looking where you're going when you do that, or not looking properly. Not turning the helmet quite enough, that's another common one, which we see, so Lou, if you stand there, learn more of that. 
I'm more looking over there. I need to rotate the head further round and the eye round. So I've got the helmet turned now, but look where my eyes are. I need to turn my eyes in the corner. My eyes are looking over at the car there. You can see that my eyes, but look there now. I roll the eyes into the corner. So we'll make sure that you can do that correctly and that you'll be doing your rear observations correctly because when you do get out on the road, it's very important that you feel comfortable making what we call effective rear observations, which are a combination of mirror and rearward glances so that you're keeping yourself fully abreast and fully updated with what's happening round about you. So there we go, rear observations. You'll be practicing that skill as well. Thank you. Okay, so we're now going to look at a skill called changing gear. Now, please be assured that if you're coming in and you're 16 year old and you're um, doing it on the scooter or indeed you just want to do it on a scooter, then the first thing to say is you won't be doing this exercise because on a scooter, which I never explained how to move off and stop on the scooter, so I'll give it a quick explanation of it now. On the scooter, your throttle is also your clutch as well as, as the um, means of making the bike increase speed. Now a simple way of thinking about an automatic is you have a, a cylinder inside a bigger cylinder and what happens is the little cylinder inside begins to expand and swell out as the revs increase and it connects to the outside cylinder. So this inside one's turning round that's like your clutch plate that's rotating. The one on the outside is the drive one connected to the rear wheel. And as long as the bike's ticking over, the little one's spinning inside, but it's not connected to the out one. When you put a little rev on it, again, it swells a bit, but not enough to make movement. And eventually when you bring the revs up, you feel like the little scooter wants to start moving. That's it now starting to rub on the outside cylinder. Now once you increase the revs a little bit more, it swells even more till it makes a firmer contact with the outside cylinder and it begins to rotate the outside cylinder and the bike moves off. So the scooter, in other words, the throttle is also your clutch. So as you increase the revs, that swells and it makes a connection. Now you can do it just by controlling the throttle and, and effectively controlling how much the clutch connects. That's one way of doing it. You can also though use it and balance it with a little bit of rear brake because on a scooter, whoops, <laughs> that was a bit of a disaster. We'll just have to hold it there then now. I've been waiting on that happening all day. On a scooter, what you actually have is the left hand side is your rear brake and your front, your, this lever over here is the, the front brake. So it's exactly the same as you would find on a push bike. Front brake, rear brake, and there is no clutch. And as I say, the throttle is also your clutch. So what some people do is either regulate the speed by the throttle and a little bit of rear brake, which is my preferred method, or they'll try and do most of it just with the, the throttle. But my preferred method is regulating throttle position and then, as I say, regulating the, regulating the clutch as as uh, as well okay so when you're going to change gear then the scooter riders don't need to do this at lesson however the car drivers will already have worked this one out i'm sure because the controls are so similar on a motorcycle as they are um on a on a on a car you can imagine if you're moving off in first gear now this is for the benefit of the novice riders here think back to your push bike with your gears on it You've only got so much power that you had as a rider and you had to efficiently select appropriate gear to release the energy that you have effectively. So when you were moving off, you tended to use a low gear, first gear for example, or second gear on the flat. If you were moving off up a steep hill, uh, then again, you definitely had to be in first gear. But if you were moving off down the hill, you could afford to move off in a higher gear. And as the speeds increased, you had a higher gear. So it was fair to say then that the lower the speeds you were doing, the lower the gear that you had or the lower the number and the higher the speeds you were doing and the easier it was to move then you tended to be in a higher gear well guess what the motorbike works in exactly the same way and we explained that about an element b so the gearbox is really just used to efficiently um, move the power from the engine to the rear wheel so that you're selecting the appropriate gear at the appropriate time now a simple rule a simple way of thinking on a one two five is up to 10 mile per hour first gear up to 22nd gear up to 33rd gear up to fourth gear uh, up to 44th gear and up to 55th gear and that's a simple way of thinking about it there is slight overlaps on that of course and it varies from bike to bike but that just gives you a rough idea that the faster you go the bigger the gear and the higher up you go with the gearbox the lower you go down for the lower the gears and the lower 
lower the speed. Now, when we want to change gear on a motorcycle, it's exactly the same as you would do it in a car. Now, for those that are novices, we would build up a bit of speed in the first gear. There's no point trying to change from first gear to second gear without building up a bit of speed, because if you do and you change the second gear, the bike won't have enough momentum, the, the gear will be too tall for the speed that you're doing, and it'll want to stall. So you typically in our yard need to get up to at least 10 mile per hour to be able to change the second gear. So you open the throttle up to give it a bit of acceleration and at the same time as you're closing the throttle, and it's a pity I'm now holding on to my mic here, you would pull in the left hand clutch. Now we call this ringing the cloth and I'll show you why just now. Close that throttle and pull the clutch in. So we call that ringing the cloth, okay? Now in a car it's called scissor action because as you come off the gas pedal the clutch goes down and as the clutch comes up the gas pedal goes down. So in a car you can see why we call it scissor action. Alright, I hope this is still working okay. Now, on a motorbike we call it ringing the cloth. As you close the throttle you pull the clutch in. So you've removed the drive power, you've pulled the clutch in to disengage the clutch so that you're ready to change the gear. If you come around this side Lewis, your foot is already under the clutch, under, under the, the gear lever. It's already underneath in anticipation of the gear change so that whenever you close the throttle remove the power pull the clutch in you then lift the gear change up fully to the next gear then you relax the the pedal you ease the clutch back out gently and you bring the throttle back on again to the appropriate position that's you now changed up to second gear and as i say you want to be doing at least uh, 10 mile per hour to attempt that gear change you don't want to take too long closing the throttle pulling the clutch in and changing the gear and easing the clutch back out and going back on the throttle because if you take too long the bike's going to lose its momentum and there's a good chance it could stall now, when you're changing from second gear back down to first, as you could have probably imagined, it's kind of the reverse. The first thing is you've got to reduce the speed. So the first thing you do is you close the throttle to remove um, power. In other words, that's your first brake that you're introducing, that's the engine brake. So by closing the throttle, you're going to get engine brake in. Now, the lower the gear, the more engine braking you get. So you might find that when you close the throttle in second gear, the bike engine brakes quite a lot for you, and you don't even need to apply any brake. Now, at this point, we've only really been using the rear brake, and we would continue, because the speeds are still relatively slow, we would continue with that theme. And if we did find that closing the throttle, the bike wasn't slowing down enough for us, we would use a little bit of rear brake. So once we've got the bike down to appropriate speed, we would then pull the clutch in fully to disengage the drive. We would push the gear lever down fully, now, if it's in second, you want to make sure it is fully down, so it goes all the way back into first. If, it, if not, you're going to go into neutral, the same as when you're changing from first to second, you must lift it fully, like we explained in element B, or you'll end up in neutral. So, you want to make full movements. Don't worry, when you're in second to third, you can't accidentally go to fourth. It only ever goes to the next sequential gear. The only time you can really make a wee bit of a mess of it is between first and second and second and first, where you can end up in neutral. But the rest of them, unless you get what we call a false neutral, which we won't worry about too much now, you you should be able to be select the next gear, in other words, sequential gear changing. Now the next thing to say about the gear changing is that when you do downshift and you close the throttle and the bike slowed down, remember if you need to use a little bit of rear brake, use it, pull the clutch in, downshift to the next gear, you don't just ping the clutch back out, you release the clutch slowly on the way out, the same way as you did when you were moving off, and you have the engine revs open just slightly so that your engine speed and your road speed are matched so you get a smooth downshift. Now, the same principles apply on a motorcycle that apply on a car, and that is you should not change gear in the corners. So here, for example, we get you to change from um, second gear down to first, going down the slight incline, and then from second gear to um, from first gear to second gear back up. Okay. Now we don't want you to change gear on the corners. That can cause a loss of stability and a loss of control. So even now, even in the yard, we're trying to teach you the correct technique for changing the gear. Okay, and as if by magic, we've got the mic now back where it should be. Now, for the novice riders, and I'm going to put the bike on the centre stand to demonstrate this one to you. For the novice riders, this can be a bit that can be a little bit tricky for you, coordinating the gear change. So what we'll often do is what we call a dry run for you. All right, we'll get you to put the bike on the centre stand, sit on the motorcycle, and we'll get you to simulate that gear change. So imagine then you've got the bike running, all right? So mm, the throttle's open slightly, and we'll get you to practice one, two, three, three, two, one. So first thing is, close throttle, pull the clutch in, lift the gear change up. So if you come around this side Lewis you'll see the whole thing being put together. So let's imagine that I'm going to be changing up the gear. I've got my throttle open a little bit, a little bit of rev on, close throttle, clutch in, change up the gear, 
relax it, clutch back out, back on the throttle. Now you've got to remember that when you change the second gear, the bike now wants to go faster due to the taller gear ratio and the same throttle position and same revs is going to have the bike faster so you've got to be aware of that and watch you're not going too fast now when you want to slow back down again first thing you do is remove the power close the shuttle the bike will engine brake for you if it doesn't do enough just apply a little bit of rear brake pull the clutch in to disengage the drive downshift fully to the next gear don't ping the clutch out ease it out slowly and then just open the rev just slightly so the engine speed and the road speed are matched for a smooth downshift now when you put the whole lot together it looks very fast so i'm now going to put the whole lot together so close throttle clutch in change the gear clutch back out back on the throttle and that's why we call it ringing the cloth see how i'm doing that together so it's ringing the cloth now we'll get you to practice it slowly one thing at a time one two three three two one and just get the memory muscle to feel comfortable with the correct coordination of the controls there's no point you trying to change the gear if you can't do it in under two seconds now so watch this um, i'm going to do a, a typical gear change here and i'm going to simulate i'm going from first up to second so there you go the throttle's open watch this is me doing it as normal close clutch in change clutch back out and back on you'll probably find that was about a second to do that if you're taking two seconds or longer to change the gear we would need to work on that before we let you go around the yard because the chances are it's probably going to stall the motorcycle so that's what we call a dry run when we get you to sit on the motorcycle kind of coordinating the controls and getting comfortable with it so let's now show Lewis changing the gear going around the yard let's show that one And I took it off there without lowering it down gently because I'm comfortable enough with a little 125. If it was a big bike, I, would have, um, I wouldn't have lowered it down like that with a big bike. And especially because the slope's working for me here. Now, let's now show you the change in gear. So, first thing is, get my observation before I move off. Now, we'll keep it in the first gear just now for going down. And I'll change from first to second going back up the slight slope that we've got here. So watch this now. I'm going to look at my speed to see what I'm doing. I'm doing 9 mile per hour just now. Building up the speed. Changing. Close shuttle clutch in. Changed up. Clutch back out. That was 12 mile per hour I did that gear change at. Now I'm going to close the shuttle. Brake slightly. Clutch in. Downshift. Clutch out smoothly. And it was a smooth downshift. And I got that in before the corner. Let's do it again going up the hill. Build up speed, close throttle, clutch in, change the gear, clutch back out, back on the throttle. And I did it about 11 mile per hour that time. Now this time, close the shuttle, brake a little bit, clutch in, ease the clutch out gently, and then nice and smoothly on the throttle. Build up the speed again, 11 mile per hour, there's the gear change did. Close the shuttle, pull the clutch in at the same time, I had the foot already under the gear change lever. Going downhill, close the shuttle, brake a little bit, Clutch in, downshift, clutch out gently, and then just opening the throttle slightly there to maintain it. So there we go, there's how we change gear in the motorcycle, alright? And you'll see that what I did there, is I only did the change in gear in our yard, on the straights. I didn't do any change in gear around the corner. So hopefully these videos are helping you. Now let's talk about some of the, the weaknesses that we see then on the change in gear. As you can imagine, the biggest thing is lack of coordination. So we'll often see people trying to pull the clutch in to change the gear, but they forgot to close the throttle. That's quite a common one, so they've still got the throttle open. Or they try and change the gear, but forget to pull the clutch in. That again is another common one. The gear change lever doesn't want to move if you don't pull the clutch in. Um, other ones we see when going between first and second and second and first, only moving the throttle, the gear change slightly, so they end up back into neutral. Or another one lifting it, thinking they didn't lift it enough, but they did, they went into second, and then they lift it again, and they go into third. And then they get confused because they're working between third and second then, and the bike feels terrible uh, in the yard here. We usually find that first and second is all we can really get comfortably in our yard. <coughs> So, it all really comes down to a lack of coordination, usually, when anyone's having a problem with the change in the gear. So, I would say the first thing is, if you're a car driver, try and think about how you change the gear in the car, and then relate that to the motorcycle, and that's going to make it so much easier for you. If you're a novice 
uh, rider and you've not got any car experience, try and think what I was explaining about how the gears work and the clutch works and the revs and the power in the motorcycle and how you can relate that back to a push bike and the fact that you have to disengage the clutch fully before you can move the gear change lever and you have to remove the power before you can move it as well and that'll help you to understand how to coordinate the controls correctly. Alright, so, so there's then how we change the gear um, with, a, with a motorcycle and as I say most of it is coordination issues. Other things that we see are people trying to change the gear on the corners themselves and it's a bad habit to get into. You don't want to carry that one out onto the road as an experienced rider either. Okay, so there you go changing the gear on a motorcycle. Now the, I have to admit the, the, worst, the hardest two gears to change are first to second and second back to first. As the speeds increase it gets a lot smoother and a lot easier to change the gear. So if you can change first to second and second back to first, I can tell you now you can do two to three and three to four and four to five and five to four and four to three and three to two. The hardest without a doubt any biker will tell you is one to two and two to one because they're the most responsive gears and they're the ones that you have to be smoothest on. So there you go, there's a wee uh, lesson for you then on changing gear. Thank you. In our next video, we're going to be looking at slow speed riding skills, including slalom, figure of eight, and U turn. Thank you for watching. See you in the next video.